Hello, my friends. This is the 86th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. It's going to be part one of another two part discussion I had with TK Coleman about race. TK has been on the show several times before in the past talking about race with me, but I feel like all of those conversations were prefaced. We were kind of laying the foundation for this epic conversation. We cover a ton of different topics from race and politics to race and culture, all under the general idea of talking about the concept of colorblindness. So is colorblindness a real thing that people can be? There seems to be two general camps. There's a big camp of people who say, yes, colorblindness is a real thing and I'm colorblind, race isn't an issue. There's another, seems to be another camp of people which says, if you think colorblindness is a real thing, you're naive. There's no such thing as colorblindness. Turns out as we get to in part two of our conversation, that may have something to do with our usage of the term. It may be possible to both see and acknowledge and judge racial differences among groups while remaining colorblind, depending on what you mean by the term. Another sticky topic that we talk about is if part of racism is that the racist looks within and doesn't see any racism, he's blind to his own racism, then how can that person figure out that he is a racist. If something like the concept of white supremacy is so tightly fused to the eyes of individuals, is it worthwhile to try to point it out to them? Is it worthwhile to try to investigate to see if you have it? We also talk about this balance of the individual and the community. So for example, my wife and I are really entertaining the possibility of moving to Japan because we really like Japanese culture and we don't really like a lot of parts of American culture. There's some good parts and some parts we don't really like. Is that desire that my wife and I have to be in a Japanese community, is that a version of racism? How does it square with a philosophy of rabid individualism that says I only am going to see and judge people based on their individual differences and not their group identity? How can you at one time acknowledge group differences and evaluate people as individuals at the same time. So if that sounds like it's a conversation worth having and something you want to listen to, these are two fantastic episodes. TK Coleman is the education director at Praxis, and he yet again was very generous with his time as I blasted through all of the hard deadlines that we set so that we could continue this fantastic conversation. I hope you guys really enjoy it. Though, man, it, it'll be fine. You know what's funny, and, and I don't know if this is something for us to get on recording or not, but you know, it's uh, you, you and I don't make our our living talking about this, right? Right. Neither one of us has even endeavored to publish a book on race or to make a lot of content about it. Um, and for most of my life, it's it's always just kind of been a thing that, yeah, you think about it. You know, you have conversations with people you know about it, but I never have had any and still don't have any dreams of being like the go-to guy Mm -hmm. on on race. And um, I I don't think you and I have much public material we've put out there where we share our ideas on Mm -hmm. it from these conversations we have. But uh, it's it's been personally enlightening. It's challenging for me because this is maybe an aspect of my belief system that has perhaps the greatest potential to offend, the greatest potential to alienate. And that's good for your character to, Mm. to, to, to practice talking about those kinds of beliefs out loud. But then it also challenges me to think about what I do regard to be an important issue from a variety of different angles. So I I, I thank you for inviting me to participate in these conversations because it's stimulated my interest more and and it's leading me down a path where I'm I'm excited to learn and talk about it more. Well, hey, I mean, you're creating value for everybody, um, but you're especially creating value for me. So I appreciate you you know, coming on the show and talking about it. And I'm with you. This is not something, you know, I've I've released uh, uh, some things about individualism and how, you know, race and individualism, but it's like an article I think I've I've written, maybe two. Um, So, but, so we're, you and I aren't actively creating a bunch of content in this area, but it's this topic that, especially in the States, is always under the surface. You know, it's constantly there. It's constantly in the news. It's this taboo issue where it's like, yeah, you can have conversations about race with your friends, but it gets especially dicey if your re- if your friends are of a different race. And it's like it's this. There, there's all this negative tension around the topic, which I think is 
awful and it, it's counterproductive. It, I think it leads to all kinds of tension that doesn't need to be there. So I'm, I'm just stoked that we can have like a free and open conversation about this being people of two, two races. This is like best case scenario. Yeah. And, and, and I'm okay with the tension. I, I think, I think it's important to, in, in order to do good philosophy, I think it's important to liberate conversations from the need to uh, make sure no one's feelings get hurt. For sure. You know, um, to, to make sure, you know, like, uh, I, I think sometimes we work a little bit too hard at, at making sure we duck and dodge and, and speak yes. in such a proper prim manner. Um, th there's one, one poet who put it this way. She refers to such people as tight-faced poets. You know, people who speak as if they're holding back a sneeze, you know? Yep. <laughs> uh, I think there's something to be said, too, about putting it out there, not being afraid of a little stress, a little tension, and in every meaningful relationship where you actually achieve progress and communication, there's there's some discomfort. So that's good, too. I couldn't agree more, and I, I'm, I can already predict the future, that I know there's a bunch of haters out there who don't like the work that I'm doing, and they're going to jump on any opportunity to paint me as a bad person. So I say anything that could remotely be constructive is, oh, look, Steve's a bad person. Oh, look, Steve has racist intentions. I know it's going to come up in this conversation. There's nothing nothing I can do about it, nothing we can do about it. And it's like, all right, bring it on. If that's, if that's the price to pay to have these conversations and try to get at the truth, you know, that's the price you got to pay. Yeah, man. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of not only freedom of speech, but freedom of silence, right? I mean, people for a, a very long time have been making decisions about which beliefs they want to talk about in public and which ones they want to keep to themselves and their families and their inner circles. And so if, if you come out here into the public space and you say something that you would like to be heard, then you should be psychologically prepared for the experience of some people disagreeing, some people not uh, liking what you have to say. And I think that's an important reminder during this time because we have a lot of different people who are making the prospect of what your life can become if you become a thought leader on this topic. A lot of those people are are, are inspiring others to, to come forward and be a little bit more bold with your beliefs. But the thing you got to remember about your favorite thought leaders and about your heroes is that they're ready for that fire. They're ready for that heat that's going to come at them. And if you're not ready for that heat, you, you don't have to come out and, and say what you believe. You don't have to write that Facebook status. Right. But you know, we're, we're, we're no victims for for having people, um, you know, express their piece about, about what we say because we're, we're choosing to be. Right. Well, let's put it out there. Um, so I was telling you before we started, uh, we've had a, a few conversations on race now. And, mm -hmm. like... I like to tell guests before they come on Patterson Pursuit, the interviews last about an hour, but there's always a special exception with TK Coleman because I think I, it's going to last. I know it's not going to last an hour this time. I would like to say, okay, we're going to talk about these things and get them done in time, but there's no way we are. And this is probably already going to be two episodes. So I'll just say, Hey, tune in next week. Cause we're going to have part two with TK Coleman about these topics. Yeah. Right, even though we right. didn't schedule it, but uh, I felt like the, we've already had a few conversations on race and I feel like the preface, like we, we were just getting going and then people don't know this, but at the end of last time we talked about race, we continued the conversation, but I had recording issues. I don't know if you remember this. I had recording issues where I only recorded one side of our audio. I don't know if it was yours or mine. And so there was a whole awesome other segment that was totally it was like left out. Yeah. It's like a solid hour. So yeah. it was about colorblindness, this concept of colorblindness and racism and a little bit of discrimination and what you could call statistical discrimination. And it was like it was like the crescendo of the multiple part series that we've had on this topic. So I want to go back to that topic um, because I feel like that's where the 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 net of the dis the, the tangle of all the disagreements lie. Um, so so uh, if I may, um, I, I would like to do a, a mini preface yeah. for those who are just tuning in to our ongoing discussion now. You haven't listened to the prior episodes, or um, even if you have, just as a way of contextualizing pretty much everything that I'll be I'll be saying in this discussion. Mm. Um, let me tell you what I think is the the unifying characteristic of most discussions on race, regardless of how people come at it. And, and how I differ from that. So I think the central issue of contemporary discussions on race is white supremacy. 
Um, whether you believe it exists or not, whether you think it's a problem or not, uh, there are three basic questions that everyone is reacting to. And that is, number one, does white supremacy exist? Uh, number two, is it possible to substantiate claims that white supremacy played a role in particular instances of, 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 of wrongdoing or, or harm being caused, right? Um, that's usually what's going on. People say that was racist. And, and number three is, what moral response mm. should we have to how we answer those two questions. Now, different people answer those in different ways. So you may have the, the anti-racists who say, yes, white supremacy does exist. Yes, we can substantiate where it's causing harm and our moral responsibility should be this. Maybe it's reparation. Maybe it's uh, white people need to take responsibility for acknowledging their privilege and so forth. Um, even the race realist would be an example of someone who answered these questions in, in the affirmative. So you listen to someone like Jared Taylor, Richard Spencer, they will say things like, uh, yeah, white supremacy, uh, you know, um, or, or maybe like white privilege does exist and it's a good thing and we should try to expand it. And mm. our responsibility is not necessarily to try to uplift black people, but to uh, acknowledge and, and perhaps cultivate a consciousness of our own identity and protect our own interests and so forth and defend our right to do it. And then you may have others who say, no, white supremacy doesn't exist, um, and the race war is the problem. And if you want to deal with race, stop talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. That may be more like a, a Larry Elder type approach to it. Um, but all of them agree on those three questions as being the important ones to have a reaction to and, and an informed opinion about. And, and for them, that's the starting point. For me, that's not the starting point. Uh, I do not believe that white supremacy is the starting point for a discussion on race. I believe if you want to get to the bottom of any kind of evil, and I, supp I, I suppose we're talking about racism because there's a general consensus that racism is evil. Um, if you want to get to the bottom of evil, then I think you have to start at the root. I think you have to start at the foundation, and that is authoritarianism. I believe that authoritarianism is the cause of all evil. Uh, and, and if I may, if I, if I may use a, a biblical example, um, if you if you look at the the Christian Judeo Christian creation account where God creates humankind, the first thing God says is, "Let us make man in our likeness and our image, and he will subdue the earth and exercise dominion over it." Right? And so there's this Christian idea that as human beings we were created for mastery. We were created to exercise dominion not over each other but over the earth. Right, that mastery, personal mastery, is is a central theme, and that we exercise our authority, our God likeness, by exercising, by by demonstrating dominion in the area of our gifting. So, well, for one person, maybe that's the piano. Another person, that's philosophy. For another person, that's serving people or this or that way. But that's how human greatness is realized, and that is how glory is brought to God when we are our best selves. Well. In the Christian notion of sin, sin is a perversion of that which is good, right? Well, what is the perversion of that concept? What is the perversion of personal mastery? What is the perversion of exercising authority and dominion over the earth through the creative expressions of your gifts and the service towards humanity? The perversion of that is the domination of one another. Our desire to exercise mastery over each other, to exercise authority over each other, to claim legitimacy to the right to rule. I would contend that is the most fundamental kind of perversion. It is the most pernicious kind of evil and all other forms of evil are rooted in it. So um, that doesn't mean we cannot have conversations about white supremacy and racism because we're going to do that here. So these things are not mutually exclusive, but as a starting point, one of those things is rooted in the other and authoritarianism is the foundation in which all things are rooted. So if you really want to fight evil, you've got to deal with that demon. And I think that's less PC. I think that's less safe. Um, I think if you want an easy career in the talking about race game, I say two things you should do is either, one, start telling black people to pull up their pants and quit committing crimes and take personal responsibility for their actions, uh, or, um, you know, uh, go around trying to get white people to admit that they're privileged. I think that that's easy because even though you'll make a lot of people mad by doing that, you already have a built-in audience of people that will love <laughs> you, support you, and finance you. Um, but what both of those sides agree on is the legitimacy of using a monopoly on violence 
to get the other group to fulfill their agendas and live the way they want them to live by force. So we don't have to have a full-blown discussion on my political atheism or my, my anarchist views, but I, I want to set that forth as the, the, the conceptual framework from within which I see these things. And I think that's the starting point. I have this urge to say amen. And like, uh, if you're going to pass around a collection plate, man, I'll put money in. Like, where, when's the church of TK <laughs> going to be a thing? Because that, that was right on, right on point. So, so now the interesting question is, if I wasn't black, would, would you have responded to me? Uh, as if as if I were sounding like a preacher. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> fair question. All right. So, okay. Well, there's a lot there, and I'm sure that's going to come up through the, throughout the course of the conversation. And I agree with pretty pretty much all of that, um, that really, if you are trying to identify the problem, and I don't even necessarily like calling it evil, because I'm not sure what that means, but if you really want to identify the problem, looking at monopolies of violence, looking at governments, looking at individuals forcibly inflicting their will on other people by force of law, I think that is more often than not the culprit. Yeah, and you are my ally to the degree that uh, you are useful to my agenda to undermine authoritarianism, and you advocate non-authoritarian mm. approaches to human advancement. So I'm all for making black people's lives better. I'm all for everybody making everybody's lives better. But you are my ally to that degree. You know, I think about the movie um, Get Out, and this is a spoiler alert, but you should have seen the movie by now at this point. Um, there's a moment in the film where the black guy and the white girlfriend, they're, they're pulled over uh, by a white cop. Now, the white girlfriend was the one that was driving, right? So he pulls her over and... He wants to see the black guy's license, uh, and 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 the you know the, the the implication here is that the cop is is being you know he, he's fitting that that racist stereotype, and um, you know he he's he's just playing it like whatever whatever you know like and he gives him his license and so forth and and that moment happens, and something comes up and the cop decides to let them go okay whatever, at the end of the movie, the person who literally tries to hijack the black guy's body, turns out to be a man that is literally blind, okay? And um, at one point, the two are having a conversation. The black guy says, why us? Like, why y'all doing this to us? And he says, don't, don't lump me in with the rest of them, okay? He says, I'm not like them. I, I don't even see color. And he was absolutely right. He's like, I don't even see color, you know? Because I, I, I just want your eyes. I want, I want those things that you see through, you know? I just want a chance to see again. And, and, and the irony of that moment was that this guy who was colorblind, okay, as well as the guy who said, I would vote, uh, vote for Obama for a third time if I could, those were the most dangerous people in his life. And they loved black people. They really loved black people, man. So, you know, I don't really care how much you love black people or any other kind of people. I want to hear something about your approach to doing people good. Mm -hmm. I think that's where all the interesting conversations lie. And I may and I may be pushing us, you know, in a direction that gets at those kinds of things as we talk. So one of the, the things that I found really valuable and um, thought provoking from the last conversations was this distinction between kind of your personal thoughts about an individual versus your actions towards them. So it's like, I don't really care what you were saying, I don't really care what your thoughts thoughts are on race. Like, mm -hmm. I care about how you treat me in life. So what I want to do is go down that road mm -hmm. and talk about actions. Let, let's, let's first give an example that isn't controversial, and then we'll make it controversial. So when I uh, am looking at the world, and my wife and I are deciding, where do I want to live? We're actually sure. really tempted to go to Japan. In our travels, we went to Japan, and we absolutely loved it. And the reason we loved it is because of the sure. culture of, of Japan. Absolutely okay. loved the culture. So when I was over there in Japan, I would, I would say all, all kinds of true statements. Like, on average, your average Japanese person is going to be treating me better, treating me with more respect, and I them, than your average American. Right? So in right. general, I'm living in Charleston right now. I've lived in a few places on the East Coast. I mm -hmm. prefer the behavior of people living in Japan to people living in the United States on average. You like Japanese people. I like Japanese people. You could say that, right? <laughs> now, not controversial, 
However, if we say, if we, t if we abstract away and we were to put different races in there, that would essentially be, I would be compared to Hitler. If I were to say something like, oh, well, I like Japanese people for these reasons, but black people or Hispanic people, because of the actions I see from you know, group averages, I, I prefer sure. not to be around them. If somebody were to say that, that is heresy. Now, I want to sure. know, what's the difference between the two? If the one is reasonable in theory, could the others be reasonable in theory? And why... Why can't we? Why can't we talk about this, uh, like calmly? And I don't mean we. we I mean uh, the royal we. If I'm understanding correctly, hmm. is this similar to Sam Harris's frustration, where he's saying, "Hey, why can't we just have certain conversations that perhaps have racial implication, but?" We're, we're trying to be scientific here, and, and I'll be the first to admit that maybe some facts might make me feel sad, but can we have a conversation about uh, racial observations w without me being called racist for that? That would be close to it, or it would be something like, I, I would add, um, it would be silly in the Japanese example to say, oh, you, Steve, you like Japanese people because they're Japanese, because they have the genetics of like something inherent in their skin or whatever it is. You, you're like a, a, a that it has something to do with racial superiority of the Japanese race, which is a position people have. And in fact, historically, a lot of Japanese people in particular had the position that literally inherent to their race is some kind of fundamental superiority. I don't I don't like that. But. Uh, if I were to say anything uh, similar about cultures in the United States, it's suddenly seen as being like this bad judgment I'm making about all people of a particular race to say, oh, in general, I have more in common with your average white guy than your average black guy. That's now the exact same uh, like moral level of evil as saying black people are inferior and I like white people more than black people, something like that. Which is, which is, of course, not correct. Yeah. So uh, first, I think there's a little nuance we can add to, to both situations to kind of, I think, make it a little bit fairer. First, there are some places you can go where if you're around the right group of people and you say what you just said about loving being around the Japanese more than them, you would sound racist to them. Would you agree with that? Definitely. Yeah. It's just that right now, you're saying that in a context where the people around you don't have anything going on, don't have any historical baggage going on with any comparisons being made between them and the Japanese. Right? It is also true that you can go to just about any race of people, with the exception of whites, and we'll come to that in a moment in this country, and say positive things about them, and no one will be upset at you. You can go to a black church and you can say, man, I just love coming to the black church because y'all really know how to praise the Lord. Like, they'll love that. They'll be like, oh, come on in, Steve. Right? <laughs> right. You, can, you can go hang around the Native Americans and you can be like, you guys really get it, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I'm white and I hang around all my white friends, but you guys know how to take the conversation to another level, whatever it may be. And people will genuinely feel good about that. Right. So no, no group... Uh, has a hard time being thought of in a positive way. And and racism is rarely understood as thinking of a group in a of another of one, one group in a positive way unless it's expressed in a manner that makes someone else feel feel like it's at our our expense. Mm -hmm. Okay? So the one group that you probably couldn't say this about in America is white people because you will be heard as someone that um, is saying white people are better than black people and everybody right. else. Right. And that's because just historically, right, um, there's a lot of baggage in this country that all of us have around that particular thing, right? It doesn't come out of a vacuum. It's not like, you know, mm -hmm. we're just having a, an all things being equal conversation. So I, I, I struggle with this, this approach to to analyzing this issue with a, with a mindset that's kind of like, 
hey, um, is it racist if I do this? Is this racist? Is this racist? Is this racist? You know, um, because once, you know, so we can lock those conditions mm. in. And now, do, do, do I get the right to call you racist? If, mm. if you make this kind of joke, do I get the right to call you racist? Right. And it reflects this attitude where we, we look at the R word as this political weapon. And whoever gets to be the one to hold the political weapon and use it against the others, that's the one that's got the power. Right. And and I understand that. You know, um, John McWhorter says that calling someone a racist is kind of like calling them a pedophile. It's a career killer. It's a reputation ruiner. And so you have a lot of people that are anxious and defensive about being called a racist. They, they've got some things they want to say. They've got some things they want to talk about. Um, and maybe their intentions are sincere, but but they're afraid that someone else is going to say you're racist. Um, uh, what was the school? Ah, uh, was it? Gosh, it was the professor, the courtyard incident where you have uh, the black students um, talking to the. Oh man, is it? Was it Stanford? Shoot, I forget. Yale. It was Yale. Yale University. There was a moment where. <laughs> the the white guy was which was was he, he was he was trying to defend himself and trying to explain himself and, and and he said I'm not being racist and one of the black students said to him uh that's not how it works we tell you if you're being <laughs> right right and, and and I think that captures the white burden right that captures the fear of white people that want to have conversations about certain things you know um, you know th that that fear of like who gets to call who a racist? You, you, you want to say something? Yes, yes. So I, this is this is exactly uh, one of the issues here is really what has happened to the word racist? Because when I when I learned about this word in grade school, it was always in the context of racism is something akin to the belief in the inherent superiority or inferiority of a particular group of people based on their race and it was very often tied to people like hitler like the, the the most racist of racists who thought this is an inferior jews are an inferior race of people and they need to be exterminated so on the one hand that's growing up that's what i think of as racist i think a lot of people think maybe a lot of white people think of that as being racist as a, a positive belief in the inherent superiority superiority or inferiority of races and then it has become watered down from that definition to something like talking, uh, making any judgment about uh, racial stereotypes or making sure. any judgment calls about uh, groups whatsoever, positive or negative. And so, so now people are afraid of saying, well, so they say, like people like me, I'd say, look, I see all kinds of differences between racial groups. Yes, on average. Yes, those exist, but just saying that doesn't mean that I have a belief in the inherent biological superiority or an inferiority of races. So if we're saying that it's okay to acknowledge what is kind of self-evident, that there are at least differences among races, and then you can have different evaluations of those differences among races, then it seems like such a like an objectively um, uh, bad thing to to tie that in with the big r word like when did that happen w w when did that sh shift happen you think this is a political shift that this is something that there's power to the word so now if we call you a racist like you said it's like well it's like you're a pedophile and so if you get if that label sticks it's going to ruin your career like can, can we agree at least that like there are two at the very least, there's the big racism, which is the one the one about racial inferiority and superiority. And then there's all like these other smaller, more irrelevant types of racism or race acknowledgement or like seeing that race is a real thing in the world. Kind of blended several questions in there together. Yeah. Uh, so first, uh, to go back to something that I said earlier when I talked about most white supremacy at the starting point, uh, if you listen to somebody like Mark Lamont Hill, for instance, he'll tell you that white supremacy is not limited to a consciously held belief in the superiority of whites. And he'll also tell you that white people don't have a monopoly on white supremacy, right? That white supremacy is an ideological uh, virus that's infected 
the thinking, the minds of many people, including black people. There are black people who hate their blackness. There are black people who are ashamed of, how, of, of them themselves being black uh, because they have been infected by white supremacy, okay? Um, there are people who uh, um, may wish they were white or may want to be white, okay? Um, so it, it, it's, not, it's not just a matter of racism is uh, you are consciously thinking to yourself, I hate people who are not white, okay? Um, according to this view, it's possible to be racist if you um, uh, treat people um, in, in, in a less charitable way or if you treat people in a harmful way, not necessarily because you're thinking at that time, you know, um, they're not white, but maybe because you don't have the same respect for them at, at a level that you've just kind of like internalized. But doesn't that um, immediately say that we're going to we're going to lump together in the same category the big R with these other forms of of racism like the the big yeah go ahead yeah so, so so let's get to that one of the things we talked about in an earlier conversation is uh, the problem that i have with this cartoonish comic bookish depiction of what it means to be a racist uh and i have a problem with this not because i think we need to be nice to the racists and win them on our side but because i think there's something very significant to getting to the root of the problem that's consistently overlooked when we talk about people that we call racist. And that is, there are no racists who think of themselves as racist, okay? Um, racists always believe themselves to be on the right side of a logical argument. That doesn't mean that they're all good spokespeople for their view. That doesn't mean they can all beat you in an argument or that they will all argue fairly with you. But you show me any example that you take to be racism, and I will show you something that underneath the surface is a lot deeper than someone getting up in the morning and saying, I'm going to find a way to bring the, the black people down. No, there's something deeper there, uh, and, and, and that is there is a belief that, that this is a rational thing to do, that this is a right thing to do. So... When, when people react, and this, is, and this is also why I think it's important to have the conversation, not debating the dictionary, not getting into a war that says, well, mm. well, why can't I use that word? I mean, you can use whatever word you want. You can define things however you want. But the, the conversational context that makes this conversation important is because there are people out there using the word in a way that you don't like and in a way that hurts you, in a way that inconveniences you. So it behooves you, just out of self-interest, not trying to be saint-like, to understand hmm. what they're reacting to. And my understanding is this. People have always reacted to the conclusion, never the argument. Never. So let's say I'm a white guy, okay? And I tell you, Steve, um, I, I raised my daughter not to mess around with black guys. I told you you don't want to have anything to do with those guys. You know, um, they'll knock you up and, you know, you'll get pregnant and then they'll go knock somebody else up because that's what those black guys do. You know how they are. Let's not be politically correct with it. That's what I teach my daughter. Now, if that's me, am I racist? That's my question to you. Am I racist? <laughs> uh, Honestly. So, so this is, Ed, you make a good point. You make a good point. So what I'm trying to say is that there are different types, there are different levels, right? So I would say that is, that is a form of racism, yes. I, but I, what, 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 what I'm saying is a variation of that same thing is what all people are reacting to. M most, I mean, the people who predominantly use this word, most people would say that's racist. And I, and I think you might want to say that too. I'm not trying to lead you down some unfair well, philosophical I, path. On, on one hand, yes, it of course, is very self-evidently racist. But what I'm trying to say, but of course it depends on, on what the meaning of the word. What I'm saying is there needs to be a special word if it's not racism it's got to be give it some other um word in front of it or come up with a new word for the racism which is literally about biological superiority and inferiority that there is a dominant race and a superior race or that the, or that the race races should not mix for some kind of biological uh, uh reason that is a really big idea. Uh, it's important to know whether or not it's true or false. I think it's false. 
I don't think it's the way that the world should work. I think it's incorrect, but we need a word for it. It's because that results in the dehumanizing of individuals from particular races because of this particular philosophy. So if we're going to say, you know, a dad given that type of racist advice to his daughter is this is in the same general category as Hitler talking about the extermination of the Jews, or I don't really listen to Richard Spencer, but and I've heard a few things Richard Spencer says about, you know, inherent superiority or an inferiority of races. That, that is not a good mix. You, you, one is extreme, one is dangerous, and one is, is uh, less extreme and less dangerous. Wait, wait. So, so I think we can make a distinction between the, the attitude that one has towards someone and uh, the belief one has about what the proper response to that attitude is, right? So a person can say, I don't like black people. I'm just being honest. I don't like them. Okay. Um, and, and, okay. Go ahead. And, and that same person can say, so as a result, I would like to say, black people, you go do you. I don't want any say on what you do. I'm not trying to hurt you or harm you. I just want to be among amongst my own people. Okay. I don't like you guys. I don't want to have a conversation about it. I don't want to hold hands or nothing like that. I don't want integration. I'm just going to do me and you do you. That would be one response. Another response would be, I don't like you guys. And I want to see you leave. Or I don't like you guys, and I'm going to try to kill you. Yeah, those are two radically different responses. And we shouldn't treat everybody like they're going to have the same behavioral response to an attitude new position. But the two things can be separated. And, and what I'm saying is when people say racism, okay, they're responding to the dislike part, the hate part, okay, um, that's directed at someone's race. And I think for the people who say racism, I don't think it's ever mattered to them that the person they're calling racist thinks they have a good argument for their beliefs. I don't mm. think that's ever mattered. I don't think that's a new thing. Right. And I, and, I, and I actually think that's true of different races too. Like I can give you concrete examples of whites responding in the same way when black people talk that way. Sure. And, and my perspective is um, I want to get at the truth. So like something that's very uncomfortable that you're not supposed to say, uh, you know, and being civilized is if it's true that there is inherent superiority or inferiority in races, I want to know about it. It's going to affect my behavior. You know, it depending on the way that the world is, I'm going to structure my ethical system. I don't I don't come up with my ethics first and say, well, if the world doesn't correspond to it, that's a problem with the world. No, it's a problem with my ethical system. So my point is to say. The, the problem with racism, as I see it, and yep. well, is self-evident when we're talking about the big racism, the big R. But when, even when you're talking about this, these other types of racism, these, let's say, nonviolent forms of racism, I think it's a philosophic error. Like, it's, it's, an, it's an ignorant abstraction error. The, er, the, the problem with racism isn't some self-evident thing. Oh, it's inherently bad to be racist. Well, what do you mean? It's, like it's, it's inherently incorrect to, a, to think that somebody's group identity is more fundamental than their humanity. Like if you're treating people, if you see people as individuals, it literally is a, is a simple philosophic error to say, oh, I'm going to have some judgment about TK as an individual because he has these properties that he didn't choose versus seeing them as an individual for the properties he does choose. That's what I see as this kind of, the, like the, the, the philosophic error with uh, social racism or whatever you want to call it. So, so forgive me yeah. if I'm not getting something here, but okay. the, the problem I have right now is I'm, I'm not conceding the distinction between these types of racism that you're talking about. I'm, I'm making the claim that for people who allege racism, and I'm not defending them, but I think it's important that if, if you feel inconvenienced or negatively affected by the way people use a word out of self-interest, it behooves you to have a really good understanding of what they're referring to in their, in their, in their mm. use of the word, even if you think it's unfair for them to do so. Mm. And what I'm saying is, I think it has pretty consistently always referred to the same thing, even though that same thing might manifest in a dramatic way like Hitler, or it might manifest in a different way, like some some guys just casually saying, hey, you know, I don't like hanging around black people. I don't like hanging around kind of people, whatever. And, and, and that is, it's a reaction to 
the sense that you hate, you dislike, you got something against me because of my skin color. And, 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 and the fact that those people have arguments or believe they have arguments or believe they, they're logically substantiated in their hatred has never really mattered either way to the people who allege racism. Yeah, I, I so I'm not sure I, I would agree, agree. So if your position is that these are the way people use the term sometimes, um, I think I agree with that. But the claim is wrong, and it's a big deal that it's wrong for the same reason that um, what's happened to the word violence. So it used to be that violence was something everybody knew what violence was. And then, especially on college campuses, the, the definition of the word started changing. And now violence was saying things that made people feel bad. So we have this very strong connotation that violence is this thing that everywhere and always has to be avoided. Well, I, I should, with caveats. It's a really bad thing, violence. And it's, it's justified to restrict people's behavior based on potential threats of violence. But then a certain group of people came along and said, oh, now when you say these nasty things that hurt my feelings, that's now a form of violence against me because it, it causes me a negative psychological state. Now, yes, that is the way they use the term, but I object. That's a big deal. I don't think it should be okay. I think we should put up a fight and say, no, that's a bad definition of violence. That that takes oh, okay. away the, the power of it, yeah. Okay, so so when it comes to violence, I agree with you that the goalpost has moved, right? That once upon a time, violence seemed to have meant something along the lines of what you do to a person physically. Um, but then it seems like that boundary expanded a bit, and now it's like violence is you hurt my feelings, mm -hmm. right? I, I agree. We should contest that. Hmm. And I believe sometimes it's important It's important to fight for language, to not merely say, oh, this is how people talk. I'm not going to change them. Forget it. Uh, th that, that's an understanding that I'm willing to fight for. That's a word I'm willing to fight for. When I talk about racism, however, again, there is a distinction between the, 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 the psychological disposition and the belief about what sort of reaction response is best. And there has always been a lot of diversity on that, okay? So there, there are people who most would consider to be racist who weren't for slavery, mm. okay? There, there are people who, you know, um, some would consider racist who, uh, you know, aren't, aren't okay with talking smack about black people in public. Okay, or who, or who aren't okay with violence. All right, so there can be a lot of diversity within a category of people that might be called racist. But what what unifies them, in the eyes of the person that are saying that's saying you're racist, you're racist, you're racist, and I just think it's important to understand where they're coming from. What unifies them is that this person has the sense that you are against me. You're and, and you're against this in particular. Maybe you got your arguments. Maybe you don't. But 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 I think you're against me. You, you don't you don't like my blackness, or you hate my blackness. And I know I'm just speaking in terms mm. of blackness, but uh, whatever the race is, you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is where this is where I, I guess I am maybe fighting language. I'm not I'm not quite sure. But let me give you an example of a friend that I had that was a, um, a <clears throat> restaurant manager, like a Chick Fil A manager out west, and he lived in a, a rural rural community, and there weren't many black people there. And he said, I, I understand exactly where this guy's coming from. Um, he said, Steve, I have noticed, and he was a young guy at the time, we, he was probably 20 years old when we had this conversation. He said that the very worst customers that come into my restaurant are black. The people that make big fusses about whatever it is are without a doubt black. And he said, so I almost feel like apprehension when a, a black customer comes into the store because I feel like, you know, the chances go up of there being some kind of an issue. And then he said, I have absolutely nothing against black people. Like n nothing. That doesn't even make sense. I see it as something that's, you know, yeah. that, that's melanin. Like, and then I feel really bad for having that feeling, even though I, ha I don't have a, a positive, you know, belief in the inferiority of the race, but I might say something like, well, you know, if the the chances of problems at the store go up and the black uh, person walks in the door. So is that a case then with this term racism where you'd say, oh, 
obviously this is a case of racism where I think there's a lot of white people who would hear that scenario and they go that, well, that's not racism. That's something else that that shouldn't get the same label. Yeah, yeah. sure. So th this is why, this is why I'm saying I'm not coming at this from a vantage point of defending anybody, but I, I care about effective communication. So here's what I would say to that. Sure. I totally understand that. Right. I completely get it. And, and, and let's just go ahead and, and, and take that on faith that like, Hey, this guy's accurately reporting how he really feels. He's just making an observation. Right. And, Let's take it even a step further and say, black people have made that observation, okay? And sometimes black people have conversations with other black people about those kinds of observations. And nobody gets mad. Nobody calls anybody racist. Some people look at it as loving. Some people look at it as, hey, this is, com this is what it means for us to care about our community. There are real conversations. I, I know that whenever uh, black people complain about uh, things like racism, uh, everybody for the first time, you know, uh, only in defense to those complaints, say things like, what, what about black on black crime? But there are, there's actually a lot of conversations, a lot of organization going on. Um, it's just that black people don't protest those things or talk about those things to white people because it's usually kind of like an inner family conversation. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of conversations that happen where black people are like, hey, man, we kind of do this thing, you know, in, in a pretty bad way, and we need to fix that. You know, what, what do you all think? Or you know what, like, I, I notice a lot of brothers are like this. I know I know, that, I know this brothers struggle with this. I know we do this and that, you know, and, and everybody's kind of chipping in, trying to figure out, well, you know, like, maybe we can come at it from this angle, or maybe this is a deeper understanding. But although I'm telling you all of this, I am the person in the conversation that will not be surprised at all if your friend says that to a group of black people and they get mad. Oh, for sure. And, and also, I'm not going to look at your friend as a victim because I'm going to expect your friend to have the social IQ to know that's the response he's going to get, right? But that and, still and, doesn't... And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask your friend, I'm going to say, I'm gonna say, hey, man, hey, um, if, if your only goal is to keep it real, be right in your own eyes and speak what you believe to be the truth, come what may then go ahead, say it. They'll get mad at you, but whatever. You fulfilled your goal. You spoke what you what you thought was the truth, and you know you fulfilled your purpose. However, if your goal is to try to change that reality, and you feel, based on your goals, that you need their cooperation, um, you might want to rap with me for a few minutes about some ways you want to do that. Because as one who knows what it's like to say those things and have them be heard, uh, I, I might be able to help you out a little bit. Um, and, 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 and the reason why it's understandable, the reason why it's not like, but that's crazy. Why is it that if a black guy says it, you know, it, it's felt like love? And uh, This is a family dynamic we experience all the time. It's the same reason why if I, as a friend, come to you and say, Steve, man, I, I, I don't think what you did was right. And some stranger from, you know, the, the, the academy who's known for going back and forth with you that you kind of already might see as the enemy says the same thing to you. You know you're going to hear it from me more. We do this in, in, in relationships all the time. Like, we allow people that we trust to criticize us in a way that we don't allow for people that we have some defensiveness against or some insecurity yeah. around. So those people are going to say that's racist. I don't think because they woke up, you know, I, you know, woke up out of bed and decided to to just use that word flippantly. It's because they're going to hear that observation as one that is being made against them. So I I agree with ninety nine percent of what you just said, and I think that's totally sensible. And I'm not even saying it's right. I'm not even saying that that, that, that it's right. I'm just saying it's the way. It is. But the. The objection, just like with the violence thing, the objection is to say, look, if we're gonna have like a real conversation, a real dialogue in a, in a country or in a culture where our culture, our American culture is made up of people with different races. I think there needs to be a, a default assumption where we can agree, well, actually, in that circumstance, it might be tacky for him to say in a, in a group of black people, like, or just stupid to say, if he does, if he's not expecting some negative result, right. but that there's, that that's truthful, that, th that he can say a claim like that and also say and i have no issue with black people whatsoever there are like like uh, the example you gave like man i don't like black people i got these judgments about them and i don't want to hang out with them okay 
that's we can call that racism. Like I think everybody can can be comfortable calling that racism. But this guy can agree with a little bit of what the racist has to say, which is, you know, in the store, more likely than not, uh, you know, there's going to be an issue if it's a black person versus a white person. He could agree with that part. But that's not nasty. That's not ignorant. That's not wrong or incorrect. That's true. And then throw out the, na- the, the nasty bits. Like that is, that seems like such an, uh, like in order to have some kind of social trust, you got to be able to differentiate between the serious racist and somebody who is making correct observations and expressing them in a way that upsets people. Steve, I have spent a lot of time in, in, in the horrific space of just knowing in my head that what I'm saying is reasonable. Just listen to what I am saying. Listen to the distinction I am making to you. Like, cons- do you agree with this definition? Okay, compare this, compare that. How are those two things any different? And people don't hear me. Right? I've spent a lot of time in that space. And I don't consider myself a victim for ever having spent a second in that space. But there's a lot to be learned from that space, especially when you are communicating for the purpose of getting another person to hear you. And again, I don't think you always need to communicate with that intent. I'm totally okay with communicating for effect Mm. or communicating to keep it real for yourself. But if you are ever going to complain about the way another person reacts to you, that means you care. So you can't be the one to pretend like you don't care, right? That means you want a certain kind of reaction. And there are some things that are useful to keep in mind if you're trying to get that reaction. Now, here's the thing. You're, you're pointing out something that's ontological in nature. You, you're telling me about what this person's intentions are. That, that, that's in the realm of beingness. But there's an epistemic problem, okay? How am I, the person he's talking to, where do I get my confidence from that he's telling me this because he cares about me? Because here's the thing that doesn't get talked about enough with truth. And I'm not saying the alternative is to lie, but the truth is often used as a weapon as much as it is used as an asset. And if you want to know, if you want to understand why so many people have a hard time admitting that they're wrong, and they're still responsible for not admitting that they're wrong, is because people are assholes a lot of the times when they're right, okay? And just because I'm telling you the truth doesn't mean I'm telling it to you because I love you, because I care for you, because I'm fighting for you, because I'm trying to help you get better. Sometimes I might be telling you the truth because I want you to feel like crap about Mm. yourself, Mm. okay? That is a reality, and that doesn't let anybody off the hook, okay? Um, If you deny the truth just because I say it in a way that makes me a jerk, you're responsible for that denial. However, if I'm the one that's speaking the truth and I care about my truth being received, then it would be irrational of me. Ding, 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 ding. There's that rationality word. It would be irrational of me. I am a person who doesn't give a damn about the truth if I disregard the following, that the person that I'm talking to has more going on in how they receive me than logic alone. They are going to react to things like how much they trust me or what vantage point they think I'm coming from. And if they feel like I'm coming at it from the vantage point of a person that's fighting for them, they will be more receptive of what I have to say. If they feel like I'm an enemy or they're not sure, they're going to be more defensive. And 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 don't get it twisted, they might actually accept what I'm saying intellectually, but because of that defensiveness and insecurity, never admit it to me, because that's just part of the social game. And it's important to have the social IQ to detect that. So it sounds cheesy, but think about the old John Maxwell quote, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You know, um, if... You know, I, I, I'll use the black on black crime thing I, I talked about, and, and I'll I'll take white people out of it and put a black person in it. Okay, um, Larry Elder talks about this all. Larry Elder loves to say, okay, that more black people are being killed by each other, all right, than than they are by the police and so forth. You go look at any of these debates, Google Google Larry Elder versus Mark Lamont Hill and watch them debate. They're on a show where the where the topic is about a black person that was recently killed in a, in a police brutality incident. That's the topic. That's what they're on the show for. And Larry Elder is persistently bringing it back to no matter how many times this happens and y'all complain about this, more blacks are killing each other. Now, people on the conservative side love that. They accept it, okay? In case you're wondering why most of the black people on the left ain't trying to hear that. 
is because the general perception. I'm not saying that 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 it's only this way, but I'm just like breaking it down. The general perception is he only brings up black on black crime as a way to silence our complaints, right? About white on black crime. That's the only time he cares about that. You know, he's never coming over to our churches and to our events. He he, he never leaves the Republicans and the Libertarians behind to come hang out with us and say, "Hey, y'all, can, how can I be a part of these discussions to to help out with the black on black crime?" No, no, no. He, he uses that whenever we want to complain about something. It's a great example of how a true observation that people will accept from someone that they perceive to be on their side, they will get super defensive about when they believe another person is bringing it up within a context where their motives are unclear. And, and when you don't know somebody very well, and it's the first time you're bringing this up to them, you're highly likely to get that. So... Let me push back a little bit. I'll say the whitest thing ever. Okay. And um, <laughs> so imagine that the goal is to have a society in which there are good race relations. Actually, Japan's kind of a good example of this. There's a bunch of, you know, surveys and videos and stuff done, people interviewing minorities in Japan, which, you know, Japan is like 98% Japanese or something crazy. And so they say, oh, as a, you know, as a black person in Japan, do you feel a lot of discrimination and or whatever it is, you're Hispanic or whatever. And they go, no, not really. I mean, every, every once in a while, you know, people, you know, want to touch your hair because they've never seen anything like it. But people are super polite. I think those it seems to be a much more uh, a much less racist um, culture in, in Japan than in the States. But so let's say, say what? No, no, go ahead. Oh, so let's say that the goal is to have a, a culture in which there's better race relations. People don't, don't have that feeling of there being racial tension there. Wouldn't it be important then to communicate that it might be the case that people's intentions on one side, uh, you know, on, let's say on the white side of the debate, are actually not as bad as maybe a lot of black people are feeling? Right? Like maybe there's a group of people, let's say, let's call them the police or the, the, the institutionalized violence. Yes, I think a lot of people can agree that there is genuine bad intentions there even sometimes. But when we have conversations about race and we say things like this, we have conversations in, in general, even if they don't sound as nice, it's not from a position of ill intent. So wouldn't that be in, important to the to the piece of the puzzle trying to improve like race relations and the culture in a, in a community is that you would want that truth to be communicated? All right. So, uh, oh boy, uh, a few things here. First, uh, I'm not sure if the goal that you stated is is the right goal to strive for, but we'll have to come back to that. Mm. Um, secondly, um, I think the the improvement uh, that this distinction brings to the discussion is. Ah, Kind of, sort of, but it also reinforces in the eyes of people who make the allegations of racism uh, what they've been saying all along. So let me let me let me concede the kind of sort of improvement. Mm. Um, in most cases of conflict resolution, I involve, uh, I mean, in which I am involved, um, I, I find that it is usually the case that the person who uh, does the offending uh, or who starts the argument or ruffles the feathers, usually their intentions are better than you know how it came out, mm. right? Um, and for the most part, the way you solve that is you kind of take ownership of it and you and you try to get better at, at, at bridging the gap between what we say and what we mean. Communication is just a hard thing. We don't always get this right. That's not a white problem or a race problem, whatever. Uh, it's just a really hard thing. Um, and in, uh, you can't go a single week without experiencing the reality of that gap. You probably hurt somebody's feelings, made somebody angry, slightly annoyed somebody or whatever, uh, because you, you said something just meaning it straight, right? And, and for whatever reason, they heard your question or your, your statement in, in some other way. That, that, that happens. And yes, it is always an improvement for people to know that you meant something that's a little bit more innocent than what you might have conveyed. Um, but... It's it, it's so funny that I'm that I'm that I'm that I'm in this position articulating this, uh, but 
the people that are are and I and 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 I'll concede that there's some diversity in, in in that movement, but the people that are arguing against white supremacy are are already saying this is why white people don't get it because they're gazing into their souls and saying, uh, I don't mean black people any harm. And, and then they're missing the point. That's not what we're attacking. That's not what we're arguing about. We're talking about an ideological virus that affects the things you actually do, the things you actually say at a level that you're not always conscious of, right? It's, it's, not, it's not that you are not sincere. It's that the result you're producing is bad. I mean, going back to that get out example, there were some nice people harming that boy. In, in fact, look, um, there are already many people on the conservative side who say this very thing all the time about liberals, right? All the time. Um, in fact, um, what was it? Um, they, they say all the time that like black people are constantly being duped, taken advantage of and exploited by people that are really good at saying things like, I feel your pain. I know what you guys are going through. Why did Thomas Sowell feel the need to say that we have to measure a policy by its effects rather than its intentions? Why does that need to be said? It needs to be said because people really are affected by their perception of, of intentions. And, and there really are people in the world who mean well, okay, and they do us harm all the time. So, so. I, I think I can a, a appeal to common sense here and say, if you truly disagree with this, let me know and maybe we can debate it. But I don't think there's anybody out there that's going to disagree with the fact that the road to hell, as the saying goes, is uh, is paved with sincere intentions, that many people are sincerely trying to do you good and they're just screwing things up. You so, know, so go ahead. You, you don't have to hate people in your heart. You know, and you can think of yourself as a good person and you can be against me or you can be against us. I think that's how the argument would go. So in that circumstance, let's say that there is this type of white supremac uh, supremacism that is subconscious. If that's true, that's a big deal. I mean, that's absolutely a big deal and it needs to be talked about. But how is one supposed to challenge it if the claim is, oh, by challenging it, you've affirmed it? Like if the claim is you have this thing about your psychology that you say isn't there and you don't see it, and if you deny it, it's just because you don't see it. That seems like a, a very hard argument to try to rebut. Yeah, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying, hey, look, um, I, I, I don't believe that white supremacy exists. I'm, I'm open to what arguments you have on behalf of it, but I don't believe it exists. Uh, and I like to debate that. And I, I like the freedom to have that debate without me being a racist. That's not quite what I, I'm, I'm that, saying. If you're, if the claim is that white supremacy is invisible to white people, how could they possibly say, well, it's not there? Like how, how, how can, how is that a debatable proposition? Like I want to talk about it. Maybe it's, I'll treat it as an empirical, possibility, but I'm saying, if I can't see it, how am I supposed to get it? Well, two things. So first, the, the claim is not that it's invisible to white people. Remember, the, the claim about white supremacy is that everybody's infected by it, okay? Um, so it's a, it's an ideological virus that is spread across, you know, to different people. There are black people that are affected by but, white but, supremacy. But how do they see it? How do the, how do the, white, how do the theorists about white supremacy yeah. see the thing that nobody else can yeah. see? So, so I, I, th I think I, I think one thing that could be said is, look, maybe invisible is the wrong word, but but rather this is something that can exist alongside sincere intentions. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I love my dog. Okay, I love my dog more than I love you. <laughs> and, and 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 have you met people who feel that way about their dog? <laughs> yeah. Have you have you met people who love their dog more than they love a human being? Uh -huh. Yeah. Who do you think has a better chance at sitting at my dinner table? You or my dog? <laughs> right. So, 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 so I'm, I'm, just, I'm using an imperfect example. <laughs> right. 
example. Like I love my dog. I love my dog more than more than my my greatest of friends. But yet, a man who is my enemy, I will allow him to stand face to face with me and relate to me in ways that I will never allow my dog. And the restrictions that I place on my dog don't come from a place of consciously held hate, okay? Um, it, it comes from a way of seeing my dog um, that although very loving, I, I still kind of see it as, as a dog. And you can force me into philosophy and, and make explicit the fact that, yeah, I guess in some ways I do see my dog is beneath you, blah, 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 blah. But, but I'm not thinking about that all the time. I, I just kind of have it as part of my, my MO, right? Like th there's, just, there's just a place I don't go with my dog that I will go with the man. And there's a zone I won't go into with a man that I will go into with my dog. And um, th th I, I, I haven't heard anybody use that, but that, that could be an example of how not invisible, but you can have positive emotions towards an entity coexisting with um, a, a comparative amount of disrespect, you say. I, or, I or, completely yeah. agree, but the trouble with that one is that it's available upon introspection. If somebody were to come up and say, hey, think of, actually think about your beliefs about your dog, actually think about your treatment, think about these different scenarios, you wouldn't let your dog at the dinner table, then everybody could introspect and go, oh yeah, of course that's there. Yeah, I guess that's funny. I use the same term, I love my dog, but I I actually have these distinctions. But in this circumstance, and there are and there are some white people who claim to have done that, and now they believe yes. in white supremacy yeah. and they call them yes. anti-racist. Absolutely, and I those so white supremacy is a thing, and I think it. My claim would be, I think it's an observable thing. Like I think I've I've met people who are. The white supremacists who could see and acknowledge and accept yeah. that and maybe feel bad about it. But yeah. there's a whole other group of people which say, I get the concept, but it doesn't apply to me. It's not there. And it's and by saying there's this there's this uh unique property of this white supremacy thing is that it's hiding and what no matter how hard you search the flashlight, you're never gonna find it, and that's of its nature. That seems to make the concept a lot more dubious to me. Yeah. So, um, and and worth and I would say it worth worth pointing out and worth challenging and saying like, the thing that you're claiming is existing all over the place in a culture that, if it do, truly does exist, is going to affect race relations. If that thing actually exists, or it doesn't exist, or it exists 10% of the cases and it doesn't 90, or it does for 90 and it doesn't for 10, that's a really, that's very important. And it seems like something that would be worth uh, stating or denying if it's not something you find within yourself. Okay, so n now you're starting to kind of get, move towards why I don't think this is a good starting point. Mm. I have a lot of different reasons for why I don't think all th those original questions I spell out around white supremacy are the best starting point. Um, but there are debates on this, and um, there are people on both sides of the white supremacy debate who, whether you agree with them or not, actually do go back and forth, analyzing the hell out of specific examples. Now, I'm a pessimist on either side gaining much by way of converting the other side. Mm -hmm. I'm a pessimist, okay? Um, but there are debates on that. There are people that go back and forth on that. Um, and I think um, it's, you know, the, the reason I, I said what I said on this topic is because we started off dealing with the issue of people saying you're racist and talking about what it is they're responding to. And, and, I, and I think it's very important to understand that when people say you're racist, it's typically irrelevant to those people that you think you are being logical in what it is you're saying. They're, they're, they're not reacting to the internal logic that led you to make the observation you're making. They're reacting to a combination of whatever conclusion you have and, and, and the emotional experience they're having of you using that conclusion against them. I think that's a useful thing to understand 
when you're communicating. That that's not an argument for anything about white supremacy. Um, but I, I mean, I don't know where you want to go with that. But so I I think that it's one thing to say that you know people have a logical reason for racism there's like like oh you think i'm being racist but really i'm being logical like that's what is one phenomena that it is the case and if you talk with people who would maybe label themselves as racist they definitely think that it's logical i'm saying something different which is that this this underlying motivation that oh like you were saying before oh you're treating me this way because you don't like my skin color you don't like this race or this uh yeah this property that i have that i didn't choose that's something that's, I think, important to communicate to say that's actually not what's going on. Like, I'm not just lying to you and, and saying, oh, I don't have those intentions. It's actually not there. It's there for some people, and some people will maybe lie about it, and some people probably will say it rather freely. But I have a positive belief, and maybe this is a more conservative thing, it sounds like, that in American culture, your average white dude really does not care, does not have strong emotional evaluations and prejudgments about people because of their skin color. Like it's not, it's, it's like, it's such an irrelevant thing. It's, it's not even worth talking about. But as so I have that positive belief, however, in the same culture, we also have another group of people, a large group of people who say, no, actually this is rampant. And it's causing all kinds of inequality and injustice in society. And so I, st I don't see how we get away from trying to communicate that the bad intention isn't there or that, that, that emotional judgment isn't there because of skin color. Sure. Uh, all the more reason why I don't think it's the best starting point. But, you know, mm -hmm. on behalf of those for, for those uh, whom this is a starting point, um, first, I, I, think, I think there are a lot of people out there who who would be willing to concede that there are white people out there that are no threat to them. They mean them no harm. Uh, even if they did, they're far removed away from their experience or they have no power, they have no resources. I, I really don't think there's anyone out there who believes in white supremacy, who genuinely believes that every white person mm -hmm. is a threat to them or even a threat to someone they care about. Um, I, I think even people who believe in white supremacy believe that there are white people that just don't have any rank, just don't have any status and so forth, okay? But these these claims typically come from specific experiences, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and, and even if you believe the experience was actually an LSD experience where they hallucinated up something that didn't, okay? The claim being made is there was an experience. It mm -hmm. could it could be something as small as somebody looked at me funny. It could have been, you know, getting pulled over by the cops and having this negative experience, whatever. But there's a reaction to that. And that reaction is usually accompanied by this ain't the first time it's happened to one of us. And this this stuff happens too much. And I don't think it moves the conversation forward if you're interested in that by responding to that by saying, well, I'm not like that. Or all of us aren't like that. You know, um, and, 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 you know, the police brutality is, is, is a classic example because it is often treated as you're, you're cop hating, you're saying all oh, cops are, are evil and so forth. And, and I, 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 th I think it's the, I think for many it would be, hey, look, um, we're reacting to specific things here yeah. that are causing problems. And if you want to debate us on whether those things are real or not, we can have that debate, but we're reacting to specific things. And wh whether it's a hundred people or you know any random white guy in any given state, it it's a big enough problem, you know, for for us to feel the need to fight against or talk about. And I feel like th this is an opportunity for individualism here, and what and why I think philosophy has such an effect on culture because seeing you and everybody else as individuals and peers, I if if you're reporting a certain common experience that's negative, that is a big deal. That is an issue, unquestionably. On the other side, just like there are innumerable experiences that Black people, I'm sure, have had in the States of what is probably real racism or real white supremacy, 
there are innumerable circumstances of white people like myself being accused of that and it being completely incorrect. So it seems like just if we're not able to talk about the validity of our experiences, we're going to be missing a big piece of the puzzle here, which is maybe we're both right that there seriously is a problem uh, on both sides. But if it's not something that's universal or close to universal or it's something like I mean, there is a movement that, you know, like uh, not all white people m movement, which is like making making fun of this idea that not all white people are racist. And it's like, yes, all white people are actually racist type thing. Like that's out there. It, it's a really big idea as peers. If we're communicating the information to say, hey, look, I recognize what you're going through is a real thing, but I don't think it's systemic. If I think it's systemic when you're talking about the police. I really do. I have I, I've looked at the evidence. I think that it's pretty nasty had some connections with people in the police force. It's pretty nasty, and of course, it's tied to government. So I, I think there's a huge problem there. But in terms of, like, our culture at large, I really don't think it is. And I think it's a bit – and I think that's, that is a bit of information that's so important. I want all of my black peers to know that. Like, I, I really – I think that would greatly improve their lives and our mutual lives together. Do you think that's naive? Mm. I, I'm not gonna say it's naive. It, I have to think about it for a while. It's it's not my battle. It's 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 not it's not a battle that I'm interested in fighting. Um, I I know for me personally, um, at a fundamental level, I I believe that it's important to be a pessimist about the wrong things so that you can be an optimist about the right things. Right. So for instance, uh, I'm a pessimist about the idea that there are people in this world who are going to knock themselves out trying to figure out a way to make TK Coleman successful, right? I'm a pessimist. I think if I drop dead right now, besides my mom and like five other people, nobody would give a damn. Out of all the people who do give a damn, they'd be over it in two weeks, more focused on what they're going to eat for lunch, right? So I'm a pessimist on that. And that makes me an optimist on, you know, what I need to do to make my dreams come true. That makes me an optimist on things like hard work, personal responsibility, and so forth. So I've got things that I'm a pessimist, pessimist about, but that doesn't make me discouraged or depressed. It makes me an optimist about different things. I place my hope in those things. I personally, lots of people disagree with me on this, but I personally am a pessimist on minorities convincing white people of anything about the way they experience the world. And I'm a pessimist on white people convincing minorities of anything about the way they see the world, at least when it comes to this issue of race. I believe that people of different races can learn all sorts of things from each other. Uh, but out of all the discussions on race I've observed, I've participated in, and so forth, I think it's so heavily politicized. I think there's so much baggage around it. Yeah, I know. I know there are testimonies of people that said, but... I participated in a conversation. I read, you know, ta Coates' book and it changed my life. I, I get that. I get there are people like that. But I think there is a pretty low ceiling for what is attainable through that, pro through that approach. Um, and that's not the equivalent of stop talking about race. Because people are going to talk about it, whether I want them to or not. I'm going to talk about it. It's entertaining. It's interesting. Why not? Um, and because I don't put race on the pedestal, I'm not threatened by the discussion. I'm not threatened by having to admit that some things are, are about race. I'm not threatened by having to concede that some things are not, like has zero political implication for me. I'm not afraid of how liberals are gonna use it or how conservatives are gonna use it. I'm free to just look at the situation as it is. Uh, but as a pessimist on where that discussion can take us, I happen to think that alongside interesting, entertaining discussions on, on that stuff, I think it's more profitable to bring the focus down to actions, what's being done. So I'll use this anal as, an, as an analogy. Like, racism is like a, a tabletop, okay? And evil, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll call evil the legs upon which the tabletop rests, okay? Um, if I attack the tabletop, I'm just going to hurt my hand and make a lot of noise and make the people around me mad. Not afraid to do any of those things, but if I have better things to do with my time, mm -hmm. I'll do the other thing. 
On the other hand, if I kick the legs under that table, that top will come right on down with it because the legs, that's where the power is. So when you think about something like racism, what makes this such a provocative thing? What makes this such an important thing to people? It's not because there are people having private internal experiences that make us feel icky. That's human beings aren't that fragile. That's not what's going on. It's because racism is used as an explanation for something else. And without the thing that racism is explaining, racism becomes irrelevant. Well, what is the thing that racism is explaining? A moral obligation unfulfilled or an act of wrongdoing performed. So an example, mm. say, let's say I walked up to you off the street and I said, hey man, you Steve Patterson, the dude with that podcast? And you say, yeah, that's me. And I look around and I punch you in the face and I say, that's for all that smack you talk about mathematics, son. <laughs> <laughs> pure mathematics, right? pure mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, can we agree that I performed an act of wrongdoing there? Yes. Okay. And anybody who saw that or heard about that would probably not be interested at all in having a discussion on mathematics. They'd be interested in holding me accountable for the thing that I did wrong, right? The, the explanation for why, it seems obvious, like for whatever reason, TK is so shallow of a dude that he feels the need to violently express his disagreement with people who criticize his positions on mathematics. So now let's change that same scenario up. So now I walk up to you on the street and I say, hey man, you Steve Patterson, right? The dude with the podcast? And you say, yeah, that's me. And I look around and I hit you in the face and I say, that's for all that smack you talk about black people on your podcast. <laughs> okay, and, and now, now I walk away. Okay, so now, we have an act of wrongdoing combined with a racial explanation. Right. He did this to me because I'm white. Now, I'm all good with having conversations that make people uncomfortable. Although I'm not so determined to prove my ability to endure discomfort that I'm gonna have a conversation that is pointless for that reason alone. But I feel no need to protect anybody's sensitivities. If something was about race, I'm going to say it, right? Like, yeah, that's about race. Prove it. How do you... Uh, no. Man, please, miss me with that. It was about race. I heard what he said. Hit him in the face because he didn't like the way he talked about black people. That was a racially charged thing. Um, but wh why, why is the racial motive a problem? If he, if he had walked past you having a conversation with somebody else being like, yeah, look, that's that fool Steve Patterson over there. I hate that guy. He talks smack about black people on his podcast. Nobody would have had a complaint about anything. He could have just kept walking and that would have been it. But why do we have a complaint? We have a complaint because he punched you in the face. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. The punching you in the face part is measurable. It's concrete. We got this dude. We got him, man. This is, we got him, right? And by focusing on the motive which I'm okay with talking about, but by focusing on the motive, we just let we just let him off the hook. We just let him off the hook. Because you know what's gonna happen now? Like, TK, you're you're racist. Ah, uh, black people can't be racist. Or you're racist, ah, uh, I have a white dog. Ah, uh, I've got, my best friend is white. <laughs> I, I, I gave $1,000 to the, uh, the, the white people together this organization, uh, the church that I go to is majority white. I've got a uh, hundred white people that are lined up right now to tell you how good of a person I am. And and now we got ourselves a five hour never ending debate about the invisible secrets of my soul that you're never going to get at. You just gave me an out because you took the conversation in a direction where even if you're correct, you just gave me the best chance for self-defense. But my argument is weakest if you move it to the plane of why of, of, of how it's wrong for me to punch you in the face. Now, here's the thing. If you remove the race part, you still have the punch in the face part and we can hold you accountable. But if you remove the punch you in the face part, even if you got the race part, you don't have anything other than some somebody's opinion that you feel uncomfortable with. That's all you got. And there's no basis for discussing anything. So, go ahead. So I, I'm totally with you, especially like talking about a political structure and talking about a lot of relations that people might have with strangers. But there's another dimension to this, 
which is the, the cultural dimension. And it's about, you know, the, the smaller circles about, you know, life, the things that matter in life. So if you're walking down the street, let's say you go, I don't know, we're a, a super racist places, but um, let's say we're in the 1940s and you're in Savannah, Georgia, right? And you're walking down the street and it might not be that people are, are politically aggressing against you, but the way that they treat you is as an inferior because of your skin color. Now that is something. But, but we, we got to come out of the abstract, man. We got to come out of the abstract. We, you got to give me something specific. What okay. does that even mean? So, so there are there's two different water fountains. There's one that's maintained, well kept for white people, and then there's the dirty, gross one that's for black people. Who owns the water fountains? Because <laughs> in, in, in the scenarios that I know of from my history, that's a really unsustainable phenomenon. It's true. Unless you have got some form of a, it's a authoritarianism fair point. backing it up. It's a fair point because. because the world I observe, it is extremely difficult to keep races apart, you know, as, as a whole. You, you, you got to threaten to lock them up to get them to stop making love to each other, drinking from each other's water fountains, hanging out, playing ball together, watching TV together. It's a really hard thing to sustain. But so if we're going to go back in history, like, okay. oh, okay, yeah, you're, you're telling me that if I drink from the white water fountain, you know, government agents are going to come, you know, sick dogs on me and lock me up. Okay, I, I get okay. that situation. It's a fair point. And historically, you're right. A lot of, I mean, segregation was, had to be enforced by state for economic reasons, that it's really, really expensive. And the, the psychological pleasure people get from segregation does not outweigh the economic harm that's done by it. And so the economics wins out. So that's, that's a fair point. So let's take a different example. Make it a, make people's it a, behavior reflects it. It's not theoretical. There's, there's evidence of people's behavior reflecting that very thing. Right, exactly. So let's talk about, uh, I'll put myself in this circumstance. Let's say I'm on campus and I'm giving a talk about the philosophy of mathematics. And uh, I've got some uh, heretical views. And let's say that the audience that I'm talking with has a bunch of uh, pre pre prejudice because I don't have my PhD in philosophy or mathematics. So what business do you have that uh, speaking about topics you don't understand, you're a stupid fool. So they don't do anything to physically aggress against me. They don't do anything that's, you know, I would sue them over, but they treat me like dirt because I don't have the appropriate qualifications. Now, I would say from a philosophic standpoint, they're being ignorant. Like that's a culture I don't want to be a part of. The academic culture, it's actually not too far removed from this scenario, is a culture I don't want to be a part of. This is part of the reason I want to move to Japan, because the way that people treat you is better by my values. You get more, like default, you're treated more as a human than you are in the States. So, boy, that was a really good example, but I lost my train of thought. Where was it go? Where was it? How did this start? Well, you, you, you agree with me that when it comes to things that are clear instances of like violating someone's political rights, like a physical oh, violence. Oh, or oh that's right. That's right. So, yeah. so this was in response to you saying that the, the conversation is, is you're a pessimist about it. So I think that's a fair point, but here's why it's not, I don't think we should just focus on the political. It's because the cultural really matters in terms of your standard of living, in terms of how you experience the world, the way that other people treat you for, the properties that you have is a very big deal. So if if what is being claimed is that in my culture that I live in, the people I'm around have a psychological bias against me because of my skin color, that's a big deal. Like that's something that needs to be talked about. It needs to be sorted out and it needs to be addressed with the people that you think are, you know, have that that problematic psychology, that psychology that's <clears throat> negatively affecting your your worldview. So why so if I think that the uh, the academic example is a good one, where it's like, I feel, I think I am justified in criticizing the psychology of your average snobby academic, and I am also justified in I think in criticizing the culture of higher ed for purely philosophic reasons, being dogmatic. So if that's okay, if I can make those criticisms and have those conversations, then why wouldn't it be okay to talk about? race, whether or not white supremacy is a real thing in society that's from either either perspective, the black or the white perspective. So you picked a very good example, because this is something that you do right now, right? You do talk about professors this way. You do criticize them this way. And you have some of them 
who like you and respect you, they still come on your show. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you've, had, you've got some professors who block you on Facebook. You've got some professors who called you like terrible names. You've got some professors who would never look you in the eye. Uh, you have like little niche cliques of professors that if they ever saw your downfall, they would absolutely love it. Some will think you're a snob, <laughs> some will think you're a hack, and you're not a true intellectual, right? And you've made your peace with that because you know that, you're, that that's one of the costs to be expected with your opinion. And even though you think they're being unfair, you also know that's one of the social costs to bear. You don't feel like a victim about it. I never hear you cry and complain about it. You just find a way to cope with it by making fun of them, by criticizing them more, by using it to you know, incorporate into your marketing and so forth. And, and you have carved out your space in the world where you got the people that get you and support what you do, and you're doing your thing, right? And you do criticize those professors, and you accept what comes with it. Um, so all that's possible. Um, I don't think we need to have a conversation about anything. You can have a conversation. Again, I'm not the guy that's like, I'm not Morgan Freeman. I'm not, I'm not saying, stop talking about race and it'll go away. I don't think that's true. Right? I don't think I don't think not talking about something makes it go away, you know. But you can talk about it all you want. But I'm saying, do you need to have a conversation with academics, uh, getting them to approve of your decision, to to operate outside of their academies? Do, do do you need them to accept your arguments as valid in order to make them and rally up the troops that are on your side? Do you need them to accept as logical your right to to remove yourself from their community and do your own thing? Not at all. You don't need to have a conversation with them at all. You can criticize them for their unwillingness to have it, but you can do whatever you want to do. That's true. However, in my closer social circles, I also want a cult. I want an intellectual community. I want to be a. I want the, the romantic academy. Like when I went to, went into college, thinking it was going to be filled with a bunch of intellectuals. That's what I want. I want to be around that. So I do want to have conversations with people who are consider themselves intellectuals and who have an issue with what I'm doing, they need to sort through that because I can demonstrate that actually you can be a real intellectual outside the academy. That kind of a bigotry, I'd say this is a, a type of prejudice and bigotry, is just ignorant. It's not based in reality. It's not based in the facts. So I, I want more people in my uh, social circle who are open-minded about that. I think it's the same thing with race. If there's a serious problem in your community, in your culture, with and you think a particular group of people are treating you poorly because they're bigoted, I think it needs to be brought up. And if the reality of the circumstance is that they're not treating you poorly because they aren't bigots, that's also a big deal. That also needs to be brought up. That's why I don't, I don't see how this kind of problem can be avoided without talking about it. If you're talking about my intentions because they're affecting you as you're a participant in the culture, it seems like we got to be talking about my intentions. All right, so first, I don't think any problem should be avoided. I, 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 think, I think every problem should be confronted directly, and I think you should process it, think about it intelligently, and formulate some informed opinions about what you think the best reaction and response to that problem is. And sometimes that involves having conversations with other people about it. Sometimes it doesn't, okay? Um, I, I don't think having a conversation with people um, is necessarily the only way or preferred way to confront a problem, right? Um, that's the first thing. Secondly, um, regarding the whole thing of like, hey, man, you know, I, I want a community that's got this and that's got this. And, you know, I'm sure there are some real good Amish people, man, that I can have some awesome times hanging out with, you know, and having conversations with. But it's probably not going to happen, you know what I mean? Because they, they got their own communities, they got their own rules, and, you know, I'm probably like a heathen to them, you know? Um, I'm probably too worldly for them. And um, and that's okay. That's okay, right? Like if you you have a son, you know, um he 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 might he might have eyes for an Amish girl and 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 she might look at him like, man, you're not an option for me. You're you're too worldly, you're a heathen, and that might hurt his feelings, you know? That's okay. You know, that that's all right. That those Amish people ain't the only folks in the world. And if if they can't be our friends or don't want to be our friends for good reason, for bad reason. So what? There's so much diversity in this world that, that we live at a time where there is no one cat out there that's so awesome at something that if we don't get that person to be our friend, you know, that we're stuck and we never get to have amazing discussions about music or history or philosophy or whatever it is we want to do. So I, I agree with you. And I think that a, a very practical way when you have seven and a half billion people on the planet to have peace is to have uh, 
uh, groups like that are not all social with one another. You you want to, uh, association and disassociation among groups. Not everybody needs to hang out with everybody. I'm totally down with that. But what happens when the the tension between those groups then becomes a problem in your in your literal community? So like I lived in Atlanta in a place where it was safe most of the time. In the evening, it was like a few streets away from places that were up and coming. It's like there's more and more racial tension there. You know, it's it, it becomes an actual issue that is not just like, oh, hey, you're going to do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. It's like, no, we are. Our futures are kind of geographically, you know, we're, we're put together. We're interacting with one another. Another reason, by the way, why I want to go to Japan is because when you have most people in a dominant culture over there, it doesn't really matter where you are. There's not good, there shouldn't be a lot of, you know, stupid tension about any of that crap. It's like you don't even yeah. have to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. So so first, I, I believe that what you're describing is a macro version of what we're all dealing with all the time at a micro level. I, I think you just described the nature of the social game. If you expand the, the tension producing elements beyond race, it is the nature of the social game that at all times we find ourselves in environments, whether they be ideological, religious, cultural, social, what have you, where there is some sense of that that space being uncomfortable for us, unsafe for us, or tense for us, and social IQ is about learning how to navigate it. So anytime you're in that kind of situation, race not being an, ex an exception, you got three options. Number one, you formulate your get out plan, right? I don't like this place, I hate this place, I hate the way it feels, I got the same rights as anybody else to get out, um, I'm gonna formulate my plan if I don't have the power to execute it right now. Two is, you formulate your protect myself to the best of my ability plan. And that can go along in conjunction with, with one, or it can be a substitute for one. Nope, I like it here. I'm not going somewhere else. I got every right to stay here, but I'm going to get my stuff together so that to the best of my ability, I can make sure that I experience as little harm as possible from these tension-producing elements. Three, you can say, you know what? I don't want to leave. And I don't want to alienate myself from the people in this community or adopt a defensive approach. I I gotta immerse myself into this and I gotta I, I gotta win the room. I gotta win the room. Now that third response is not for the person who isn't comfortable with vulnerability, compromise, or making concessions. If you don't like those things, it's all good. Options one or two will probably do for you. But if you really want option three, then you got to be very comfortable with vulnerability, compromising, and, and making concessions. And that means, you know, you got to take that he that is greatest among you is least among you approach. You got to take that, you know, St. Augustine, uh, seek first to understand, then to be understood approach. Hey, because after all, you are the one who wants the friendship. You are the one who wants community. You know what I mean? Um, it, it, it's, it's, you got to be the one to approach and be willing to take the risk of approaching and creating misunderstanding, be willing to get rejected, be willing to be laughed at, be willing to accept that feedback and figure out how to get more creative, be willing to learn what you need to learn to step up your communication game so you can be in that space and get what you need. But And, and, I, and I don't see how the addition or omission of race from that element changes those three options. So that yeah, it's an interesting point you bring up, and I wonder what you think about this. Um, this is also kind of tied to both of our political tendencies, which is as uh, anti-monopolists. Um, I like the idea of voluntary governance, right? The idea of people voluntarily getting together and say, hey, these are the political rules that we're going to live by, and if you don't want to abide by them, you don't have to. Um, you know, you don't move to that particular geographic location or whatever. I wonder if if what I'm part of my internal tension about this issue is that I really want a culture that's kind of arrived at through this voluntary means whereby biological features are essentially irrelevant. Like like I I really would love to be in a community and where where people had the same views about race that I do, even if it's a minority. Maybe I'm not worried about my neighbors here. Maybe I think this is what I'm getting in Japan a little bit, where it's like, 
it's really irrelevant. I mean, it's it's relevant in the sense that it's relevant for your life and it affects your experiences. But in terms of like how I evaluate you as an individual, I'm going to treat you as an individual first, period. It's like I just like I want the little cultural or the, the little political island of people, you know, wanting uh, voluntary governance. Maybe this is what this is coming down to is the solution is to have voluntary cultural norms where it's like rather than fighting racism and and engaging in this discussion about is it white supremacy is it not white supremacy is it racism is it not blah 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 just be like hey you guys have your argument i'm gonna go seek out the people who are not going to bother with this okay so so here's my devil's advocate challenge to you yeah very curious about your response to this especially if you don't need that community to be big and i'm not trying to be facetious here i'll explain myself why not just go buy a home or rent an apartment in a like mostly white conservative community and uh and, and be happy there i'll tell you why because first of all m most of your black folks that are you know creating this kind of trouble for you creating this kind of discomfort the people that will call you racist most of them are going to be on the left right um and a lot of the whites on the liberal side you know, are going to bring this up too, for whatever reason. You can call it white guilt, you can call it sincere belief, for whatever reason. Mm. This is certainly be a conversation that keeps coming up. Mm. But the group you decide, the, the group you describe, sounds like conservatives, right? Because for the most part, conservatives feel like, look, race, racism may exist, but for the most part, it, its place is exaggerated. We pretty much eliminated institutional systemic racism. Um, there may not be equality of outcomes, but there's equality of opportunity. If anything, it's racism against white people now. Um, it's all about personal responsibility. We're all equal. In fact, I don't even. See, I, in fact, I don't even see color. I, I'm, I'm colorblind, yeah. and I, I, to be honest, I'm kind of confused by people who feel the need to talk about race all the time. I'm exhausted by debates on race. Like, why? Why don't we all just like work hard, love God, take care of our families, pursue our dreams, and do our thing? Like. Yeah. That's the community you describe, yeah. and I'm not trying to be facetious or anything. Yeah. I'm genuinely asking you, why not just go do that, and your yeah. dream is fulfilled. And I'm laughing because I, I, I have a funny answer, <laughs> which is that I don't like white people. <laughs> I'm sorry. I yanked the earphones out of my face. That's a joke. That's uh, why you want to go to Japan. That's, that's the answer. Because of the nature of these viewpoints... I, if I could find that type of community, I would not, I am demonstrating, I wouldn't give a shit what race they're from, but I don't see that with, with in general, the white community in America. And I do see it overseas more, at least in Japan. Wait, it's, that's why I want to move over there. You don't there. think I accurately describe white conservative communities? Uh, I have, um, n part of it. You have not. There's a, another very big part which is lacking in those communities, which is the intellectualism. So, like, I grew up in in various places on the on the East Coast that were largely white. Some place, I mean, then later on, I lived in Atlanta and D.C. and stuff. But like in my youth, I was in the middle of Central New York, and plenty of white people, very conservative, but not, but uh, that that culture was one for extroverts and not one for introverts that they kind of poo-pooed intellectualism in a few places i also lived in um, a place called hornell new york which is like one of the it's just a county a really economically depressed county lots of white people lots of rural white people um no thank you i don't like the culture because they're not as rational as i would like and i'm not a big fan of that version of Christian evangelicalism, which is kind of everywhere in the in those communities. So, that's really funny because in we and I talk about Japan a lot, um, but my, my wife and I went there. We had no expectation whatsoever that we were going to like it. We literally wound up going to Japan kind of on a whim as we were traveling around, and I wanted to have conversations with Buddhists there. And so we wind up there and. In a matter of a few weeks, we totally fell in love with the place because it's a land for introverts. Everybody's quiet. Everybody's respectful. And so much, we love the culture so much that we're literally learning a new language, one of the hardest languages for English speakers to learn, Japanese, so that we can move over there for exactly that reason. So if I liked American white culture more, then that's what I would do, but I haven't found it in the States. 
<laughs> I got you. So you're formulating your Japan plan. Yeah, yeah. And and this is a true story. I mean, my wife and I are hopefully next year going to head over there and maybe make it permanent. I mean, I, I want to raise my kids, I think, more in that culture because it's more intellectual and rational and peaceful than it is uh, in this culture. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think I, I understand that. And I, and I think that's consistent with the three options I laid out. But, but I think the three options I laid out are not just a, a suggestion for you or any kind of devil's advocate thing. I, I think it strikes at the heart of, um, of, of, of a, very large, uh, a very large part of the solution. All right, that was part one of my conversation with T.K. Coleman. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and we'll tune in next week for part two, episode 87. Where we focus, we have a, a large section where we focus specifically on the word colorblindness. What really does that mean? But that's all I've got for you today. I'll see you guys next week.